Hey team, we're gonna learn how to programmatically send emails with SendGrid and Next.js API routes. I'm Colby Fayok, and if this is your first time here, make sure you hit subscribe for future updates. Sending emails to communicate with others throughout the web is a critical way of how our world works. With SendGrid, we can programmatically send those emails, whether it's from our application or just from a general script. For our use case though, we wanna use the SendGrid mail API, and to do that, we need to use an API key, which we don't want to expose directly inside of a client-side application, so we need some kind of server-side code in order to send those requests. For our particular use case, we're already going to be inside of a React application with Next.js. The cool thing is Next.js supports API routes out of the box, so we can safely make those requests with our API key and send any of our mail through that service. So to see how this all works, we're going to start off with Create Next App. So in my terminal, I'm going to run yarn create next app, and then it's going to go ahead and get all the packages so that I can install and preload my application where I'm going to call it my email app, where it's going to install all the dependencies and get us started. And once it's done, I can CD into that directory. I can even run yarn dev, which will start up a development server, which I can open up in my browser. And we can see that once it loads, I have my new Next.js app. So starting off inside of my text editor VS code, we can see that in the pages directory, I have this index.js file, which is gonna serve as my homepage. For our demo, I'm gonna create a really basic contact form, which just has a few fields like commonly name, email, and just a simple message so that we can test how our mail API endpoint actually works with SendGrid. So inside of my homepage, I'm gonna scroll down. I'm gonna get rid of all this content inside of my grid. And I'm gonna start off with a simple form with a method of post. And then inside of that, I'm gonna start off with some paragraph tags and a label, which HTML for, or name as our first one with a label of name, and then input type equals text. And let's call that name equals name. And that'll be our first input. I went ahead and added another two for the email with the type of email and a text area for message. And then finally, I'm gonna add a paragraph tag with a button and we're gonna say submit. So if I look inside of my application, I can see that it's not really the most usable form in the world. So I'm gonna add a few tweaks with it where inside of here, I'm gonna add a new style tag where I'm gonna add JSX. So we can write some JSX in here. And then inside the string tag here, let's say we want our label to display block and even add a little bit of margin bottom for 2EM. I'm also gonna say my button. Let's add a background color of blue violet a color of white, add some padding. Oops, 0.8 EM, 1 EM, I think that'll be good. Border of none, border radius of 0.2 EM. And let's see how it looks so far. I think that's good enough for our purposes where we're gonna be able to enter that name or email address as well as a message. For fun, we can also modify some of the other features on this page. Like I'm gonna go and I'm gonna say, please be a human. I'm gonna make this a contact form. I'm going to get rid of that footer at the bottom. And I think that's good enough for now. So ultimately what we want to happen is when somebody fills out this form and clicks submit, we want to capture that request, that form submission, and we want to send an actual request to our API endpoint that we'll set up in a few minutes here. Just as a quick disclaimer here, make sure that if you're serving an open web form with an open endpoint, that you're using some kind of spam prevention and security measures to make sure that people aren't compromising those accounts and making sure that you're not gonna get overwhelmed with emails. So to start off in our code, we're gonna add a submit handler. So we'll say on submit right on our form element, and we're gonna define a new function handle on submit, where I'm gonna copy that function name, go up to the top of my component, and we did define that function. I'm gonna create an async function called handle on submit, where the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna pass in an argument, which is going to be our event. And we're gonna say e prevent default, which is gonna say, hey form, we don't want you to actually submit to the browser. The next thing we wanna do is actually grab all that data from our form. So we're gonna first define a new form data object, where inside of that, we're gonna create a new array. So array from, where we're gonna take the current target from our event, so e current target, and this is going to be our form. And what we wanna access is our form's elements. Just as a quick aside to see how this works, if we go to our web console, we can search for that form inside of our DOM, where we have our form right here. If we type in dot elements right after, we can see that we get this collection of inputs, which is what we're gonna to use to capture all of our form data. 
The only issue with this collection is it's not by default an array, so that's why we have to wrap it with array from, which will turn it into something that'll be iterable for us to actually loop through and grab that data. So I'm gonna say on that array for each field, I'm gonna say, first of all, if we have a field without a name, which by default, our button will come through as a field without a name, we're gonna say if field name, we're gonna add an exclamation point so we can say if there is not a field with a name, then we're just gonna simply return. But otherwise, we're gonna say form data, and we're gonna say our field name is equal to our field value. So what we should end up with is an object where we have a bunch of properties that are associated with the name of each of our fields and their value. And we can test out what this looks like by console logging out our form data. And now if we try to submit this form, we can see that we have that object where we have our keys and we have our values. So now that we have this form data, we wanna actually do something with it. And that's where our API route is going to come in, where we're gonna take this form data and we're gonna send it up to that API route where it's then going to process that data. And it's going to send it to SendGrid, which is going to send an email for us. If you're not familiar with the Next.js API routes, they actually come with one by default, where we can see that it's located at Pages API Hello. We already see that our homepage is being loaded at localhost, but if we open this up in a new tab and go to API slash hello, we can see that we get that object with John Doe right inside of our browser as a GET request. Now, for our purposes, we can go ahead and create a new file, but let's just reuse what we have here. I'm gonna rename this hello to mail because ultimately this is going to be a mail endpoint. And instead of name John Doe, I'm gonna return status okay, which is just a common practice for when returning a 200 status, which is successful. And now we can see if we go to our new API endpoint for mail, we get our status of okay. So at this point, we have a working API endpoint, but what we wanna do next is actually accept some data as a payload from our application so we can use that to process that mail request. Now what happens is whenever we trigger this endpoint, if we're sending data along with it, this request object, the REQ, which stands for request, is going to include a body property, which is going to have that data as a string. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a new constant called body, which we're gonna set equal to JSON parse that request dot body where what it's gonna do is because it's coming in as a string and we know ahead of time that we're gonna be sending JSON to that, we're gonna parse that JSON so that we can access it as a normal object as our body. We can also test that out to make sure it's working by console logging out our body. Now back inside of our application, we wanna actually send this form data to that endpoint. So we're gonna use the fetch API, which comes in pre-baked into Next.js, where we're gonna run fetch and we're gonna specify that endpoint, so API slash mail. And we're gonna actually set an option for our second argument with a method of post. And we're gonna also send in a body where we're gonna send JSON stringify our form data. And now if we go back to our application and we try submitting that again, we can still see that we're getting that console log out inside of the terminal from when we're logging out the form data. But if we go over to our terminal, we can see that we're now getting a console log with that data from our node API, which is our API endpoint. So that means inside of this Next.js endpoint, we have access to all that same form data that we just passed in from our Next.js application. So now that we have our contact form working and we have our API endpoint able to accept that data, the next thing we need to do is set up SendGrid so we can actually take that data and send it as an email. If this is your first time using SendGrid, you can head over to sendgrid.com where you can sign up for a free account. And they have a nice free tier where you won't have to pay a thing for sending some emails. Now, when we first get into the dashboard, if this is our first time using it, we'll have some options here where we can get started. But if this isn't your first time, or even if it is, we can go into our settings where we're going to go down to sender authentication, where we're going to authenticate a domain, a custom domain with our DNS provider so that we can send emails as that custom domain. Now for this next part, you're going to need your own custom domain in order to authenticate it so you can send requests on behalf of that domain. If you don't have your own custom domain, I'm pretty sure you can still use SendGrid to actually send emails, but I highly recommend that you use your own custom domain to send emails to make sure that people are getting a better experience when they're knowing that those emails are actually coming from you and your domain. So once we're ready, we can hit get started to authenticate our domain. We can select our DNS host, which for our purposes, I'm gonna use Google Domains. So I'm gonna select Google Cloud, 
and you can also select if you want to brand your links from this domain. I'm going to leave it as the default for no, but you can change that if you know what you're doing to whatever you'd like. And here we're going to add the domain that we're going to be using for our email. So in our example here, Jane Doe at example.com. So for my demo, I'm going to use fayok.com. And now when I click next, I can see that I get this list of DNS records or C names that I'm going to need to add inside of my DNS provider, which in my case is Google Domains. Now for this walkthrough, I'm going to use Google Domains, which is the current service that I use for all of my domains. But what we are going to be doing here should be very similar no matter what provider you use, whether it's GoDaddy or Namecheap or whatever. So in particular with my domain, I'm going to head over to the DNS section where if I scroll all the way down to the bottom here, we can see that we can define some custom resource records. In particular, we can see that we have these two inputs where we're going to want to select from the drop down the C name, which is exactly what SendGrid wants us to add. So back over to SendGrid, I'm going to copy and paste all of these DNS names as our name field and these canonical names as our value inside of Google Domains. Now the trick here is when we're actually copying this over to Google Domains, we won't only want to enter the beginning of each of these fields. We don't want to include the actual domain name on here. So just as an example for this first one, I can still just go ahead and copy the entire thing and paste it in here as a custom record, but I'm going to remove this fayok.com. I'm also going to grab the value of that and paste it in, and we're going to remember to set that as a C name, but then I can hit add. We also want to make sure we take notice here that these records can take up to 40 hours, 48 hours to actually propagate. So make sure that you're not doing this with anything that's time sensitive, or just keep in mind that that might take a little while to propagate if you're adding these records. But now we can see that I went through and I added all these records and we can head back over to SendGrid. So now back in SendGrid, we can see that I can go down here and I'm going to click I've added these records since I did, and we can click verify. Now, lucky for me, since this was the first time I was adding those records, they're brand new records. So they're actually going to propagate more quickly, or at least that's in my case with Google domains. So now that it works, we can go ahead and continue with our authentication. So the next thing we're going to want to do is create an API key. And we can do that by going over to the API key section right here in the settings. And if we select there, we can see that currently, if this is our new account, we have no API keys but I'm going to create a new API key here. I'm going to name it contact form, which you can name it whatever you'll remember this key to actually be associated with, but then we can also set the permissions. Now I'm going to leave mine at full access, but you can just as easily go through the restricted access and customize with all the different permissions that you want for that particular key. But just to keep going with this tutorial, I'm going to keep it at full access. I'm going to click create and view. And we can see that I now have generated this new API key, which is what I'm going to use for making those send grid requests. Now, as it says here, they're not going to be able to show this again. So make sure you copy this key to a safe place so that you don't lose sight of it. Otherwise, you'll have to delete this key and regenerate a new one. But what we can do in the meantime is we're going to take this key and we're going to head back over to our application where we're going to use an environment variable so that we can substitute that value right inside of our code. So inside of the root of our project, I'm going to create a new file called .env.local, and I'm going to set a new variable of sendgrid API key, and I'm going to set that equal to my key that I just got from the dashboard. That way, inside of our application and inside of our node function, we're going to be able to access the sendgrid API key as an environment variable. But once you have your API key saved, we can click done, and we can see that once it loads, we can see that API key, and we can even create a new one if we want. Next, in order to actually send these emails, we're going to use the mail service for the SendGrid web API. And we can see if we scroll down here, it gives us a few ways about how we can set this up. But mostly what's important is we want to install this node package at SendGrid slash mail. So in my terminal, I'm going to go yarn add at SendGrid slash mail, and it's going to install our package. And I'm going to go ahead and spin back up my development server. Now we want to actually import that package. So we're going to say a new constant of mail. We're going to set that equals to require that package name. Now, before we can actually use this mail library, we need to set our API key. So we're going to say mail.set API key, and we're going to set that equal to process.env.sendgrid.underscore API key, which is exactly what we set this variable for inside of our env.local file. Next, we want to actually create a message that we're going to send with the mail API. 
So I'm going to create a new constant called message, and I'm going to set that equal to a template literal where we're going to be able to form our message. So I'm going to say the name, we'll set that equal to our body.name. We could also add backslash r backslash n, which is going to help us create a new line to format that for plain text emails. So we'll also add our email and our message. So email and message. We probably don't need this r and n at the end of this one. Next, we wanna actually create the data payload that we'll send right directly into the mail API. So we're gonna say constant data is equal to spell that right, constant data is equal to two. And I'm gonna send this to hello at colbyfayok.com. I'm gonna set it from hello at fayok.com, which if you notice, fayok.com is that domain that we're currently validating that we just set up inside of SendGrid. And because I have this domain authenticated, I can really send this from wherever name I want, whether this is hello or hi, but I like to use hello, so I'm gonna leave it at that. But also we can add a subject, which I'm gonna say, new web form message. Then we wanna set the text property, which is what we're going to set equal to message. So if someone is receiving a plain text email, they're going to receive that string, which is why we set the slash r slash n. But then finally, we're gonna also set the HTML. I'm gonna paste this one in here, but we're gonna take the message and we're gonna replace those instances of slash r slash n, and we're gonna replace all of them with a br or a break tag which is our way of setting a new line if we're actually sending HTML emails that would recognize that break tag. And now finally, once we have our data object, we can simply run mail.send and we can pass in our data. So now for the moment of truth, we can actually test to see if this form is working and sending the emails on our behalf. So if we head back over to our application, we can click submit and we can see now right inside of my inbox, we have our new web form message we have our name and our email, and actually we have a little bit of a bug, we have undefined. So let's look quickly to see what that is. If I look at my message, I can see that I definitely typoed that. I'm sure some of you definitely caught that as I was working through it. So let's change that to message. I'm gonna go back into my application and let's click that to confirm it one more time. We can even see the payload going out with our email, message, and name. And yay, now this time we can see that we have our name, email, and we have our message. We can even see that this is coming from at fayok.com. And for those of you who are interested, we can even go to see the original message, show original, where we can see that this is coming right from SendGrid, exactly how we set it up. Email is definitely a critical component of how our world works today. And being able to have a contact form, whether it's just for getting in touch with a personal blog, or if you're trying to take business inquiries, is an important way of being able to communicate with others. The cool thing is between SendGrid's API or Next.js API routes, we have a lot of flexible ways to be able to use these emails, whether it is for contact messages like that, or if we wanna send notifications in case there's an error on our website. What's your favorite use case of programmatically sending emails for something that's not necessarily a contact form? Let me know in the comments. Otherwise, if you like this video, make sure you hit thumbs up and subscribe for future updates. Thanks for watching.